What's up Grinder School, this is Characters, and welcome to the new series Through the Micros, where we're going to be climbing the ladder of success from 5NL up to 25 no limit. I usually do sort of 50NL, 100NL vids in the past for you guys, and I figured it would be pretty good to turn our attention to the lower end of the micro spectrum and work away from 5 through to 25 and show you what the differences are between these stakes. Um, so the way these sessions are going to work um, it's going to be like a two-parter at least, and I'm going to be four tabling. I've got one table of 5NL right now, one of 10, one of 16, which is this new, strange, somewhat unnecessary stake that Stars seem to have made, just for people who like awkward amounts, pre-flop. Um, and then 25 no limit, where we're going to reach the higher end of the micro stakes. So yeah, we're going to four table, and we're going to talk about the differences between these games. Alright, so I've got one table of each here having table selected. It's actually crazy, I mean it's um it's three o'clock, three PM on a Monday afternoon here in the UK and the tables are dead. I've just sat here for like five minutes trying to find a game at ten and L, which is pretty ridiculous. Sad times when everyone's having to work and the fish aren't able to play poker. It's a shame that fish have to have jobs. So um so yeah. What what's been up? It is warm in Scotland today. It's the end of March. It's like 20 degrees Celsius, whatever that is, in Fahrenheit for you Americans. I'm not quite sure, but a lot higher than it should usually be. This is usually still like winter, and it's seriously warm. Blue skies. Now I'm in here grinding out some videos, but I'm right at the window, so it's all good. Right, so what are the general sort of differences? Let's start at 5NL and you know, before I started coaching I wouldn't have had much idea how 5NL played, I never played it back in the day, I started at 25NL and sort of worked my way up from there, but I've been coaching a lot of people, my girlfriend grinds 5-10NL, so I watch that all the time and I watch my students play these stakes, so i got a good idea how they play now, um, and 5 no limits just very much, it's just you never encounter any real aggression, like the regs are generally just so straightforward and just so tight, they're just like on the nitty side um, you never really get like semi loose aggressive or loose aggressive regs so they're quite easy to pick on, you know, you can bully the regs a lot with sort of selective 3 betting and just a bit of aggression in the right spots and position um, and things like that I better just make sure my HUD's actually working for you guys and then you obviously get the fish who are who are going to be pretty awesome to play against. So this is kind of marginal to flat with 8 10 suited here but I've got I don't know anything about these players yet. I expect there to be this guy to be a fish or to be a couple of fish. Good chance of a multi-way pot in position so I like the flat there. Um, this guy checks and we've got backdoor draws like there's a good chance he's check calling like some kind of ace high here or some kind of lower pair. He might just be you know fair fold like I talk about a lot of the regs here are so straightforward and he just doesn't like this because he thinks I've got a lot of pairs in my range. So I'm just going to take a stab here and then I've got so many turns I can barrel as well. I expect his check call range on the flop to be seriously wide like ace highs and sort of low pairs and the board's only going to get worse for those hands. Um, I probably wouldn't barrel an ace turn because I think he has a lot of ace high but there's a lot of hands there. A lot of turn cards there we can barrel. We got backdoor straight and flush draw so anything that gives us equity. Basically any card that just makes ace high even weaker which is almost all of the deck so I'm very much inclined to fire two. So 5L has a lot of these guys like this one we just saw here. This guy's probably a reg. You would not see many regs check fold a board like that at 50 or 100 no limit. It will happen with the sort of worst ones, but like you can just see bet there. Um, like see bet in there is incredibly standard. I've kind of bought in deep. Didn't really mean to do that, but oh well, that's fine. I'm deep with this guy, so we can do some set mining. Um, so, and then you get the fish who are just awful at every limit, but 5 and L they're even worse than they are higher up for the most part. And then you get a whole bunch of nets. One thing that five uh, five no limit on stars is really abundant with is just nets. I'm talking like I think guys that live in like random third world countries and they actually play these stakes and make a living by like mass multi tabling five no limit, ten no limit. Sounds kind of ridiculous, um, you know, for me because the amount of money you would make would never sustain you in this country. But if the cost of living is like, really cheap, I think there's a load of guys. Um, random places in Asia and stuff who actually make a lot of money, relatively speaking, in these games. So you get a lot of those sort of 
mass multi tabling guys that run like eight three and those guys obviously are just ideal to have on your left. So in terms of table selecting at five no limit, you know, I'd still do it. Um the nitty regs and the nets aren't actually the best people to play against at the stake. Like you'd be so happy to play against those guys all day at hundred no limit, but at five no limit, um you can find so many fish that you should just be tagging everyone who isn't a fish, like any kind of reg or net that you see regularly, just make sure you've got a colour coded tag on them if your site supports that. And that way when you look in the lobby you can just eliminate the tables that have those regs and nets because you can just look for the fish. You know, this red grape juice, you know it's a little bit sickening after a while. At first you're like, oh it's so nice and sweet and then you kind of just hate life after about half a glass. <coughs> Ten no limit is much the same, I wouldn't say there's a big difference. The only thing is that the regs become a lot more common. You know, a lot of people don't like to regulate 5 no limit because not that many, a lot of the people who do regulate 5 no limit, you know, they move up so you don't really see them there because it's very easy to beat it um, if you're a regular. Here I'm going to, sorry to interrupt the, the spiel of 10 L, but at 25 no limit on table 1 here, um, I'm going to go ahead and 3 bit reason being this isn't quite good enough to flat however it does play it does play very well um giant nine suited here if we do get flatted there's a lot of flops we can have a good amount of equity plus fold equity on uh, it's kind of the top of our folding range like we discussed before in the spectrum um and it's i expect to get a lot of folds because even at 25 no limit i've done nothing yet people don't really like to defend the three bits so wide and this guy's already decided to fold to one already so okay so in this board we get a couple of backdoor draws it's not the best board in the world people do defend queens here but you know trips isn't super likely should be a bunch of like pairs in his range or maybe like some kind of ace jack ace king broadway kind of hands um i'm going to start off by c ben here and there's no need to make this at all big can afford to make that really small. So we get 3-bet here at 5 no limit. What does a typical 3-bet against an unknown at 5 no limit mean? Usually it means that they're either one of the rare kind of regs that can 3-bet light, a maniac fish, or they have a strong range. Now the latter of those options is by far the most likely. King Queen's very dominated. I'm not going to get it in like 80 big blinds deep here, blind versus blind, so I'm just going to fold because defending is going to be pretty dodgy, being out of position with no initiative against a potentially really strong range. But we'll keep an eye on that guy. I mean it is possible that he is one of the the other aforementioned player types, like the the reg or the the really spazzy fish who just sort of splashes about a lot pre flop. You get a lot of those guys. Um yeah, so our C bet on this board, um I think it's fine because he has a lot of hands that I think are gonna fold by the turn. He has a lot of sort of pairs here. Um maybe like sevens plus type thing. Um possibly ace king, possibly ace jack, hands like this that are, there's a lot more combos of them than there are of queen x hands basically, and these hands are going to, I expect them to be 4 betting like queens, kings and aces. Preflop. I'm going to just pick on this guy because, yeah, we have a blocker, we have an ace, we're in position. It's not the best hand in the world to 3-bit with, but I think when we have position and he's just a 0-0, zero, zero, I think he's going to be pretty tight to 3-bits. Most people at these stakes are, who aren't too active, like there's a lot of just, like don't think that just because someone's a little bit netty pre-flop you can't 3-bet them, especially when you have a blocker, like it's always, almost always going to be good against a tight player here, um, because just as they're tight with their opens, they think they have a netty image, and so they're tight with their 3-bet defending range as well, so you can actually, one thing, like I watch, I watch my girlfriend play these stakes quite a lot, like usually 5 or 10, no limit, but it still applies there, and one thing that I was sort of saying that she doesn't do enough is 3-bit bluff because it's just so easy to just run people over at uh, these stakes and also it's good to be building an image if people are really tight to 3-bits because there isn't a lot of light 3-betting then you want to be building some form of aggro image so that you can actually still 3-bet for value you don't want to be in a sort of position against these guys where you're having to flat like aces pre-flop all the time because they're just folding so much to 3-bits and stuff like that you know you want to be able to 3-bet ace king and know you can do it for value so it's good to initially start off just by picking on the weak, basically. Picking on the guys that you think are going to be folding. This is so small and I have a suited Broadway connector on table 2 here at the 5 and L game. I expect his range to be very strong, but I'm going to make appeal for implied odds and sort of use my position post-flop and flop the nuts like that. And hope he doesn't have ace-king. Um, 
Yeah. She makes it 45. Um, I don't see this board getting like too worse for his range. You know, if he's got like queens, jacks, aces, there aren't going to be too many scare cards. Um, I'm not so worried about flushes here. He doesn't have that many suited combos, so I'm just going to flat and you know allow him to potentially barrel, um, leave his range wide for now, and then we can use our positions. So if he checks, we can obviously bet. Again, this is great because we have position here. There's no need for us to do anything other than just call because the pot's going to be such that we can shove the river if he checks and we can just call it off if he jams himself so there's no way we're ever folding here we're just going to get it in the best way possible and that when we have position we have that extra luxury we have extra options on all streets if we're out of position there maybe we need to raise the turn but being in position it's just a really easy call because we get to leave bluffs in his range spaz in his range like that I don't know what he's doing with jacks there with three streets it's a bit strange um, so my open size here is going to be just a min race because these guys are just seriously tight and I just expect them to, to not adjust so I want to be risking the minimum to take down the blinds all the time and if we can force them out of their comfort zone and make them defend a bit more they'll probably make mistakes post flop because they're not comfortable playing wide ranges we can assume and what I do here is just tag these guys as nits so I mean his mistake there is just offering me a really great price with his 3 bet he should just basically be making it bigger than that so I can't just profitably peel trying to flop the nuts like I did there and I don't know why he's like bet bet betting three streets I don't think people are so stationary even at five no limit I don't think someone with my sort of stats is so stationary that he's gonna just stack off with like tens nines eights there it seems very far-fetched to go for three streets of value I think it's more just more just the case that the villain doesn't know what he's doing so he's sort of here again there's no need to make this like 15 cents um, be a bit of a leak so we're going to go ahead and make it 12 because this guy is a bit 3 betty so far we don't want him to be 3 betting us all the time although he's probably not that light and this guy's a total net so there's no need to be risking the full 15 cents it seems trivial to anyone who plays higher but these think of these as big blinds you know you might say 12 cents 15 cents is like literally no monetary difference but in terms of win rate and big blinds and money earned and hourlies there is and the more of that you can make the quicker you can move up the ladder um, so I would 4x queens on the 25 NL table if I had some fish about, but I'm under the gun here, I'm just going to 3x, I don't really see the need to be 4xing, I don't have a lot of stations, I don't want to discourage action here against tight players, so. So basically against uh, under the gun open, I've got quite a tight image here, um, I'm probably just going to flat, I don't think like 3 betting's that great, I mean unless we know that he's a bit stationary to 3 bets, I don't want to do it for value, I'm not happy at 16 NL getting it in pre-flop with Ace-King against an under the gun open, if this was 50 no limit and I knew the reg that was opening, I'd just 3 bet jam because there's all sorts of 4 bet dynamics and I could potentially be bluffing, but at these stakes, like, no one's really going to be um, 4 betting light against 3 bets of under the gun opens, it's just not going to happen, so I feel like we just don't really get called by very much worse and getting it in probably slightly negative EV so I'm not going to do it. We get 3 bet here by someone who's been really active. I think a 4 bet looks again looks really strong here. We've opened under the gun. I've played with this guy before so maybe he's a bit spazzy. 4 betting and getting it in would certainly be okay but I think calling is better because when we 4 bet and get it in we never really have much more than sort of 45% equity against this range I wouldn't think. I don't think many people 3 bet and get in jacks here so I'm just going to flat and um, hope for a good board and then continue on good boards. I think it's more plus EV. Or am I out of position there? Oh, I thought I was in position. Couldn't see the button. Um, even so, it's kind of close. I might have elected the 4-bit had I realised that I was out of position, but no biggie. I'm just going to go into sort of... There's a couple of options. I can just check call down and like allow him to, to barrel and stuff. Like The board will run out. I'll run out awkwardly sometimes, although not super often, I wouldn't think. Um, this guy 14-7 again, expecting to be quite tight with 3-bet, so I'm just going to flat the ace-queen here as opposed to 3-betting it. Um, I'm going to see if we can maybe induce something. I'm going to make a small race here. Get it another two streets. He flats like really quickly. What's his range here? Probably like, like when he flats that quickly, probably like 
tens or jacks if he has them, and then like aces or kings would be the rest of it if he doesn't. Which is a little bit dodgy. He could also have something like ace king if he doesn't really know what's up. Um, I'm just going to lead here because I think there's a load of hands just to overcard combos, Broadway combos. I have to fold. We've got some backdoor draws and stuff, and some decent equity. I don't really think we can do much, but basically get this in now. Oh well. So he does 3-bet pretty light against under the gun open, so that's definitely something we should note. There is also the chance that he just has some kind of 3-bit um, bluff hand that has a 9 in it. Um, that obviously isn't going to fold to the flop raise. Or there's tens or jacks, people just three bet those because they don't know what to do. Um, aces or kings are a decent part of his range, but like I don't feel comfortable like check folding that turn against someone that looks really active so far. Um, so I think when we get a board like that, we do have to be getting it in. The reason I raised the flop as opposed to just calling was I felt like it made it a little bit easier to play rather than us sort of check calling and getting into an awkward spot on like bad runouts. Although there aren't too many on that board, so it's probably fine. But I felt like it looks really full of shit when we like min raise a board like that against someone who I've got marked as a sort of aggro looking reg. I think we can probably induce some stupid stuff. So I'm just trying to work out how to widen his range um as much as I can. Um what's the hell sixty three make this like what one eighty five or so? One eighty. I'll talk about why I'm making this three bit bluff in just a second. So yeah, I'm trying to work out like the thing about being out of position is like if I was in position I would flat there all day. Being out of position, it allows him to just control the size of the pot. If he has like jacks or tens, he can just check back turns and that way we don't get three streets when we lead river and he calls. So it limits our value a little bit being out of position there. Um and also like I think that it looks so full of shit that a guy like this is gonna be inclined to do something stupid a lot of the time. So um, I three bet there again. I just feel like people fold too much to three bets at all these limits: five, ten, twenty-five, and L. You know, people say don't three bet bluff at the micros, like at the really small micros, and that's true for a couple of reasons. Mainly because you don't want to be like when you're just new to the game, you don't want to be putting yourself into all these weird situations that you're totally unfamiliar with. Like that's something you want to avoid. And you also don't want to be doing it too much just because so much of the player pool are fish who don't fold. So you don't need a bluff range preflop against fish, you can just widen your value range. So those things are true, but it's not true in a vacuum to say that you shouldn't 3-bet much because there are so many people who are great to the target with 3-bet bluffs, like, you know, the regs that fold too much and then the nits. And at these stakes, they're all just going to be playing badly against it. And I think you should be taking advantage of it. So 3-bet bluffing is totally fine at 5-10. 16 NL, as long as you, you're you doing it in the right spots against the right people. And that's the thing to make sure you understand. Alright, so I was... A lot of hands came up there. Good, interesting spots, actually. But I was talking about like the sort of differences between these stakes and the player pools. And, you know, what assumptions we can make against unknowns at each level and how these differ. Make a fairly large C bet here, our draw's just so good, like it's basically a value bet with so much equity and implied odds. Right, so ten NL is gonna there are gonna be a lot more regs than five NL, that's the main difference. Some of them will know about three betting light, although not many. There'll be a bit more aggression pre flop. Post flop is still gonna be fairly straightforward. Um basically you just got a table select a bit harder to find the fish. Like you don't the fish don't just stroll up to you quite like they do. At five no limit. Sixteen NL, I don't know much about it, I'm just gonna sort of bypass it. I've never played it or seen anyone play it. I think it's just gonna be a cross between five and ten NL basically. But I think twenty five NL is the sort of minimum that a lot of players like regs are willing to play, even if they're bad because they just have too much pride. So I'd say sixteen NL is much closer to ten than it is to twenty five. That would be my my sort of educated guess on the issue. Um with jacks here, like usually this is just a flat. There's also a fish in the blind, so I am going to flat. Um, 
if I had more history with this guy and I thought I could get it in profitably with a three bet, or if I thought it was stationary versus um, three bets, then I would also three bet. This guy, however, he looks like a bit of a station, so I think three bet and ace king here is going to be totally fine. Um, make it like. Expert sizing, gotta be precise. Um, so he checks here with jacks. We're just gonna obviously go for value now over three streets. So this guy, like, the clue here is this gap between V pip and PFR just sort of means that he likes. He's quite content to put money in the pot without the initiative. That's basically the indicator there. So whereas we flatted against the sort of tighter regs under the gun open before with Ace King off. Um, we decide to 3-bet that just because the guy's likely not able to fold ace-queen, ace-jack, king-queen in the same way that the other guy is. So we can actually get the initiative, build a pot with good equity in position, do it for value and be very comfortable about it. If the guy 4-bets, like, it's kind of just... I'm not doing very well. I can probably just fold. Like, 3-bet folding ace-king there, I don't think it's bad against someone who we just don't expect ever 4-bet bluff. I think we'd be getting it in with no more than 40% equity against his range if we're lucky and then his 4 bit range might just be kings plus or something quite conceivably so I think it's fine to just go ahead and 3 bit fold there because we're getting 4 bits so infrequently that we're not making a mistake by folding because we think he has such a tight range to do it so and um, this board is kind of dodgy like I think it hits a lot of a lot of ranges pretty well that defend out the blinds uh, it depends if he's like a fish then we could get away with a c bit but I'm going to check back here take a free card I don't want to get blown off my gutter I've got equity here and comes out leading the turn there's not really much we can do but fold there but I think it's just a little bit too coordinate coordinated and it just hits his range a little bit too well and we don't have enough equity and we don't want to get blown off the gutter I'm going to take a free card try and hit it and then make a delayed c bit if he checks the turn probably especially if we get like an over card that makes his range weaker like his pairs and things this guy's 3216 again we've got like a little gap here between VPIP and PFR. It's a small sample though he could easily just be a reg so I'm not going to 3-bit here although it is tempting. If I had a better read that he was definitely stationary then it'd be a pretty easy 3-bit for me. My 3-bit's 30% there otherwise I would have probably 3-bit that hand as well. But I look like a little bit of a 3-bit maniac. Um, again here is a good a good spot to lead because I've got these backdoor draws, I've got equity but I don't want to check raise because I just feel like his c-bet range is too strong. So I want to do something, I want to make a play at this pot, I've got too much equity here and his range is too weak for me to want to fold. Although there's nothing wrong with check folding, like it's fine, you still beat these games check folding here but I think this is a good spot just to go ahead and grab the initiative. I'm getting off a lot of low pairs and just unpaired Broadway ace-x hands here. Like, I think it's fine. We go ahead and turn a f jack high flush draw. Um, I feel like <coughs> I should probably just fire turn and river here. He may never fold a 10 but there's a lot of like good rivers for me as well. I can get him off a 10 on I can probably get him off a 9 or a lower pair with a club by the river like almost all the time so I'm gonna go ahead and fire turn with the intention of firing a lot of rivers here too. Picked up a lot of equity so remember that always helps us we don't need folds anywhere near as often now. If he has a flush draw, he's often raising the flop. I'm not too worried about that. We do rep flushes very well, so it's a mandatory bet on the turn. And it's one of the reasons that we dunk. You know, we don't we don't like to dunk as much in spots where we know that there aren't many good turn cards for us. There we know that there are a lot of good turns. Um, a lot of turns we get equity on, and a lot of turns where the board gets scary as well. Like, we've got these back that are flush and straight draws. Like, we can... We don't just want to be check folding that much equity when the guy's just open to cut off and likely has quite a wide range. So, look out for spots like that. But also, remember that check raising there is only good against someone who we know c-bets a lot. That's not the kind of board people like to c-bet light. So unless we know that you c-bet in light, we probably just want to go ahead and lead. Because if we're checking and then attacking a c-bet range, we might be isolating a strong part of his range by taking that line. Whereas when we dunk, we're just going for, you know, absolute fold equity against this whole range. And there's a lot of stuff that's just given up there that's just going to fold to the lead. And, you know, it's just not going to put up much resistance. <coughs> Don't do it against some kind of maniac. I remember I, I did this. I made a little short about Donkey and someone said, um, oh, it's terrible because, or I don't like it because it's so standard just to raise a lead. It's like, well, I don't think it really is anymore. I don't think 
many people just automatically raise leads and if they do then you can just so easily kill them by leading every time you have a value hand it's just great so yeah look out for people like that there are still some some regs are so mindlessly aggro that they just like to to do that all the time um what's this guy he's opening far too much oh, he's open no small blinds yeah i don't think i've three bet him yet i've got quite a tight image i'm not quite happy enough to flat this hand so i'm gonna go ahead and just three bet it expect to still get quite a lot of folds I don't think 4-bit bluffing is too rampant here and I, I look fairly tight, I've not been doing too much so far so 3-bit bluffing is going to be insanely profitable Um, we're really deep here so I'm obviously never folding 4s usually I wouldn't set mine out of position with a small pair here because his range isn't that tight or anything and it just sucks, I'm running like god at these stakes I wish I ran like this at actual higher stakes But yeah, when we're this deep, like we don't need to get a stack as often because there's so much more for us to get. I'm just gonna check raise. I'm out of position. We're really deep. I need to be building a pot like now, <coughs> if I've got any hope of getting all this masses of stack in. Ace is kind of an annoying card. It's awesome if he has like Ace Ten, Ace King. It's not so good when he just has top pair without it, without an Ace. It's gonna scare him now. Huge three bet on table three at ten and L. We just fold. Um. I'm going to just go ahead and make this like fairly big. <coughs> I still think he's never folding King, Jack, King, Queen. He's got a second pair in a gar. I don't see him ever folding these hands. He looks a bit stationary. He's 16 in L. Sizes, man, they really confuse me. Okay, now how much can we bet in the river? A lot of his range is a bit weaker now, like those second pair hands that did have gutters in the turn are now just second pair in the river, so we don't want to bet so big that he folds those, because like King Queen, King Jack, King Nine and stuff, that's like most of his range here. He does have some two pair hands, or maybe some random Ace Queen or something sometimes, but I don't think we should make this too big. I think we can just go for like 485 here and expect to get called. It's probably small enough or looks small enough that we can still get called by King X sometimes. He jams. Um, I'm not going to fold now, obviously. I think he does have Queen Jack here. A decent amount, or a higher set, when he jams that quickly. But 6 into 23, it's just never ever a fold. If he ever has two pair, or it's just spazzing about, then we have to get it in. <coughs> so that's pretty unfortunate. That's what I would call an absolute cooler. Good thing it happens at 5 and L. Yeah, I mean, he played it well, actually. Like on the flop, he just, he's getting a great price with all that that's left behind so he should be calling there um, and then on the turn there's no reason for him to raise he should just call again so this guy's cut off one out of five yeah I mean I'm gonna go ahead and just put this guy to the test as well I do think these nets are absurdly tight with three bits even though he's like 59 he's still gonna have a bunch of hands he can't continue with we block jacks and tens like I think we get enough folds here easily like nits do not like to flat out of position. Like, not at all. I would... See, it just works so often against these guys. Like, it's really... It's really a great way to make money at these stakes. And it's something people, I think, should be doing a lot more. I would 3-bet this, but I've just been 3-betting loads against this guy. So I'm going to give him a break for now. <coughs> yeah, I mean, in the on the river, in that hand where we have bottom set, I expect to lose a lot of the time. But given the sizing and what's left, like, if there's any chance he ever has, like, just two pair or something... There is absolutely no way that we can fold. We only need to have the best hand like a fifth of the time or something to call there. So I'm not in any world going to fold bottom set against a probable fish at these stakes for a price like that. It's just not going to happen. So this would be a really bad board to um, see bet here. It's just way too coordinated and we're multi way. So that's already two of the factors going against us. So 25 and L when we get to the top of the ladder, that's like, that's the first stake where I really think you start to see any form of the the sort of pre-flop aggression that you'll hear about on forums like the 4-bet and 3-bet wars, that kind of thing. I don't think it really happens until we get to 25 and L. At 50 and L it gets a bit crazy, like it really becomes quite common. At 25 you can still table select and avoid all that crap, you don't need to get involved in that crap at all until you get to like the likes of 50, 100 NL. Um, 
And yeah, there are still plenty of fish if you table select. It just means like there's a trend like the higher you move up, the more work you need to put into table selection to ensure that you've got a good win rate. And it is really important. It's good to play against regs, but that's going to happen anyway. You don't need to force that. You can just table select, find fish. The regs are going to be finding them too. They're going to be there. You're going to get experience. You don't need to seek out tough games when you can have soft games. The more money you make also, the more quickly you move up and then the more you learn because obviously as you move up and games get tougher, you start to learn a lot more and much more quickly as well. <coughs> oh man, this grape juice really does nothing for my thirst. Um, yeah, so a suited ace under the gun, especially one that's like a wheel ace, one that can make a wheel straight. Pretty decent choice of open to sort of mix up your range under the gun, and also there's a fish in the pot. I want to target him. I don't even care that he has possession because he's so bad. Like my edge is going to be so great that it totally negates that. <coughs> And multiway pots are very good for my hand, so if I think that's likely, then it's another good reason to open. Like flush over flushing people was more likely multiway. Um, basically, my nut flush draws are just a lot stronger. My odds are a lot better. My three bets like through the roof on this table, unfortunately. This guy's probably still gonna fold. Wait, he's just joined. He's only been here for eleven hands, so he doesn't know that. So yeah, I'm going to attack him. People don't expect their under the gun opens to be attacked too much at micro stakes. I think it's going to be fine. I've got blocker, suited hand. It's a pretty good choice of hand. Flop really well here. <coughs> There's a lot of pairs here. He's just going to fold straight away. Just to uh, a C bet here. <coughs> um, if he calls, he likely has some kind of strong hand, like an ace most of the time, or pocket kings, or something like that. Maybe like king queen sometimes, but you know we have position there. We have the luxury of being able to just check back turns and see a free free river card, and that's all good. And if we need to get it in the flop, we can probably do that, or we can continue to flop raises anyway. It's like so much equity and position. It's a great situation, and so much of his range has to fold as well. Like sort of nine to do jack sort of stuff, it's just too weak to peel. <coughs> Um, I could ISO this guy with King-9 off, it's just a little bit too too weak. I think King-10, I would definitely just raise it up there. It might even be fine with King-9, it's kind of marginal borderline stuff. Wow, bet's like three times pot. So I'm going to make this a two-parter. As always, let me know what you think about the format of seeing these different games. There's not like necessarily too much illustration as to how different the games are, because the spots that come up are quite random, but I think you see the general trend that it just gets a little bit more aggressive as you move up, and just all the things we talked about. So this guy isos the button here. I have king-queen. So my hand kind of... it plays well versus this fish, so flattens okay, but it's kind of awkward multi-way out of position. It's not the greatest. Um. I'd rather just 3-bet here, like turn it into a bluff, and if the fish wants to come along with random suited junk, then that's great because King Queen's probably doing fine against the fish's limp calling range. If he's really stationary, he might even just call his 3-bet with a load of shit just so he can see a flop. Then we can see bet profitably, value bet top pair profitably, and it's all good. I'll open King Jack here for the sake of the video and because I have two fish and one who I have possession on. <coughs> haven't been tagging players as frequently as I would normally. Um, I'll start doing it just so you guys can see how I tag. So, like, guys who are obviously fish, I just give them the fish tag. Like this. Um, you can see how often these three bets are working. Like, it's such a gold mine at these sticks. Um, so, this guy, like, I just have to fold here. I'm not getting a good enough price. He's only got 10 bucks. He has the nuts most of the time. Um, or has me dominated. And I'm out of position, so it's a very easy fold. Like, don't fall into the trap of just being like, oh, it's only a slightly over a min raise, so I have to call. The thing is that what usually makes it callable when it's a small raise is that the implied odds are there because the guy has a full stack and he's just min raised you and you can see a flop and try and flop the nuts. Here, this guy only has like 
sort of 40 big blinds, so we don't want to be calling out a position with a really terrible mining hand. Like, King Jack off is as bad as it gets for sort of mining. If we flop top pair, we usually go broke a lot of the time. Reverse implied odds are just all over the hand, and we don't have really much scope for flopping, like, straights and flushes. We can flop some straights, but he often has sets and stuff and has loads of equity. So the story is that it's just a really, really bad hand to try and mine against strong range with. We'd be much happier there with pocket fives, and even that would be a fold just because the stacks are too small to offer us the right price. But it is, you're not just investing like the other few big blinds there, if you call preflop in that King Jack spot on table one. You're also putting yourself in a situation where you're probably going to lose a lot of money post-flop just due to the fact that you're dominated a lot and if you, you don't want to even flop a pair, like that's how bad it is. <coughs> and always pay attention to your own image as well. Uh, these stakes, like no one is going to mess with something that looks nitty at all. So like, if you run like 13-10 then go ahead and start 3 betting a lot more pre-flop and just you'll find you've got more fold equity against the players that are aware and you're not bluffing the fish anyway who aren't aware so that doesn't really matter um, against this guy I'm just going to go ahead and bet here my hand's too strong not to just see bet for value and protect my hand and get called by a lot worse so <coughs> um, usually I would fire two here like sevens nines are definitely calling now if he's got some kind of like 7-8, seven, 7-9 seven, hand, well not 7-9, that's nuts. So 6-7, seven, 7-8 seven, hand, that's not going anywhere. Um, I love jacks sometimes. I could probably just check back and then fold the river if he bets. And then go ahead and value bet if he checks again. I think checking back's best just because I'm more likely to get called on flop and river. And also I lose less money when he actually has a jack and leads the river at me for value. It's sort of, I'm using my position here to get information. You don't have to bet to get information, you can just check and get info. Now a lot of hands with sevens in them get there. If he leads this river, I'm just going to fold, even for half pot. I'm just never good here. But I use my position there to sort of check back turn. And that way I know if he checks river, then I've probably got the best hand and I can get my second street of value. But there's no need to really go for it on the turn because it's not that clear a value bet. It's kind of murky. It's only like slightly plus EV probably. And on the river if he checks it becomes very plus EV. And we get to fold the worst hand more comfortably on the river. Because I don't expect him to just bet out there with like some middle pair hand that we're ahead of. And he doesn't have any air in his range when he calls that flop. And that turn comes down. So yeah. Definitely best to check turn and then look to fold to river bets. And value bet if he checks. Hopefully that makes sense. But it's just another sort of illustration of how great it is to have position sometimes. It makes life so much easier. This guy is like really 3 bet happy so far. 100%, 30%. I've um, got blockers here. I think a 4 bet will get a lot of respect to these stakes. I don't know if this guy, if this is just variance, but I assume this guy's light here. I'm going to assume he's pretty light here and I'm going to go ahead and. Make a four bit. Um, shit, I'm just gonna hit the time bank and I'm gonna bet here. Yeah, so the fish has a fairly wide range here, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be giving up yet. I wanna definitely see bet here because there's just so much stuff he has to fold. I don't wanna like surrender the initiative and start having to check fold. And the four bit works. I mean, as three bets get a load of respect at these stakes, four bets also get lots of respect. I don't trust the fish to fold any pair now. I mean, I just have to check fold. There's not really anything else I can do. He may just have over cards and check it down with me. Who knows? Um, but you can't go barreling multiple streets against a guy like this. It's just too spewy. It's far too likely you can't get him to fold like second pair. So don't do it. This is another good squeeze spot with ace five. Preflop aggression is so much more in these games actually than it even is at 50 and L, just because people are just way more fit or fold against it. 
people aren't playing back at me all the time, people are just giving me pots pre-flop over and over again, it's insanely profitable. I think if you take one thing from this video it should be that you should be looking for these spots pre-flop. And now the great thing is I've got this image so now he's probably going to mess with me or in the near future he is anyway. Oh I probably shouldn't have folded there, probably could have flatted but time down. See now he calls. I think he's going to have a lot of random overs here. I'm going to check call the flop. I don't want to bet the flop because again I'm going to check call the turn here. If he's going to take a stab with overs that's great. I think he doesn't ever check a pair that quickly on the flop so I think I have the best hand here most of the time. And I think his turn bet in range will mostly just be stabs at this point. I don't really see what the hell he checks back that flop instantly with and bets to turn with, so I think I have the best hand a good amount. Jack distorts things a good bit, but whether or not he can actually... Oh wow, he checks back ace-8 on the flop, okay. But the, that's the thing, we got him to defend with ace-8 suited there. Like, we've now shown that we're crazy pre-flop, we've got this image, and then we can tighten up and make the adjustment and only start sort of 3-betting for value from that point on. That's going to work pretty well. Okay guys, I'm going to take a short break, then I'm going to come back with part two of this video that you'll see in a couple of weeks or whenever it comes out. And um, we're going to play this ace-king hand again, like we've got this crazy image here, we just want to 3-bet and get this in. Our image is going to work to our advantage. getting loads of calls now. This flop isn't so great. Like, it's really not so great. It's very good for a lot of the Broadway hands he defends with, like, sort of Queen X hands. Um, he may have some lower pairs that fold here, but I don't know. I'm in two minds whether to see better. I think I'm just going to check back here. I don't feel like this guy's in a mood to fold, um, especially on a board that hits his range pretty well. And we do have, like, some good equity. We don't gonna get, We don't want to get blown off and some decent showdown value. It's kind of a close spot. I do expect now to get called really light if I bet this turn. I think I'm just going to try and check it down. I don't know that this guy is bad enough to defend like pocket fives out of position. If I put all those pairs in his range or have a reason to, then I would just bet and try and fold them out. If I don't think he has those hands, I don't really want to be just burning a bunch of money against like pocket tens and all these hands that aren't really ever going to fold. Okay, so it's eights. Should probably want to note that he's flatten three bets a little bit wider out of position. But yeah, I mean that's the lowest pair I'd imagine to have. I wouldn't think that people have deuces through sevens there. If I do think that, then I'm gonna bet. I expect just him just have like tens jacks, um, maybe some like ten nine suited hand or something like when he's just checking back there. Like if I get called, I expect to be in pretty bad shape and I don't expect to fold out many better hands because I think he's just going to not have the small pairs and that those are really the only better hands I get to fold so if he doesn't have those then it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to bet there I'd open this all the time if there were fish in the blinds but there's not, it's just a reggae table so you can probably quite easily find a fold with ace 10 off Okay guys, hope you've enjoyed this video. Please leave me any feedback, comments, questions about hands, questions about the format, comments about the format, suggestions for future videos, whatever you want to say. Love to hear from you. And good luck at the tables. Until next time, thanks.